Okay, so as we spoke about last time, um, the image classification you can do using meta features or you can use raw image data. So for assignment three, you'll be using metadata. So, and specifically we are looking at the um, iris data set uh, where you have different subspecies of the iris flower. And given a flower, you wanna put it into one of these subspecies. You wanna classify it as this or this or this, right? So you can use uh, the logistic regression, for example, to uh, look into that, yeah. Um, am I audible for everyone? Yeah, so sound clear. <clears throat> okay. Okay, any other questions or thoughts on any aspects of the course so far? Assignments, lectures, office hours, quiz sections? I think we have a quiz section today after class at 6 p.m. So do attend it uh, to get some pointers on the assignment. Uh, some structured content will be shared in the quiz section. And then <clears throat> the office hours, obviously, you can discuss any topic you like. Um, it's more open-ended. Okay, so today uh, we'll do a recap of uh, binary classification. Um, we look at some classification metrics. So metrics is a very important part of uh, machine learning, right? It's not enough to say, I applied this algorithm using this library on this data set and I got this result. You have to be able to say why that result is good or not good. And that's where metrics come in. So, and different kinds of models have different kinds of metrics. So understanding the pros and cons of different metrics uh, is very important. And when you go to the industry and you, uh, you know, are working in machine learning, for example, uh, if you have to justify your model, you will go back to your metrics and say, hey, look at this metric. It looks good on this data set and it's justified. Okay. And not... Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah. So not just that this metric is high, but also this metric is valid. So we look at some examples where a metric can have a really high value, which means it looks good, but it's not the right metric to use for that example, yeah? And we'll also look at um, train data, validation data, and test data, and splitting data into different components, which is something that you will do for assignment three as well. And <clears throat> understanding why do you split data like if you have one data set, why split it into three, right? That is important to understand too. Uh, we'll go through that. And then we'll also finish with going through overfitting and regularization. We looked at overfitting in the last lecture a little bit. Um, we looked at, I guess we looked at regularization more in the last couple of lectures. So we'll kind of put it all together and see how overfitting, um, you know, goes hand in hand with regularization and <clears throat> you know, how, how these things come together. Okay, so again, uh, all of these concepts and more are present in this nice book, uh, which I, I recommend for a conceptual understanding of machine learning. So feel free to go through that. As we're going through the lectures, you want some reference, this is a reference I would suggest for it. Okay, so like, this is a nice picture, we are here. Um, and yeah, image classification. So this is our use case, right? Then we are here, I guess this is something <clears throat> we look at in every lecture. Okay, so flower classification yeah, was, uh, was an example that we started off with. So these are subspecies of iris, right? And given a flower, you wanna be able to say, is it one of these subspecies? And, uh, you know, we said that this is like metadata um, or some high level features, let's say high level features. <clears throat> because if you look at an image, it has pixel values. So those are raw features. But here, you're not just looking at a raw feature. What is petal length? It's like the length of a particular set of pixels, like in this case, violet color. So that's a high level feature. So you can say, um, Petal length and sepal length are high-level features 
that are extracted from the raw features that are already present in an image. So <clears throat> for this data set, you may not even see the image, right? In, previous, uh, in the previous assignment, we were working on images. This is an example where the high-level features are already given to you. Someone has already measured the length of a flower, measure the length of the sepal or the petal, and right, so the variation between sepal and petal is able to tell you which one is right. And there is a little bit of a fine aspect here is uh, something called feature engineering. So if you go to um, industry, people will say that 70% of machine learning is feature engineering. Of course, and, and data. So I'm kind of including data. In it. So 70% of your work, roughly, um, is on getting good features for your machine learning model, which you would then train. So constructing these features is called feature engineering. Like here, for example, <clears throat> we are going from the raw image. So this is pixel level features. And then we're extracting maybe more, you know, refined features. We can even have this continue more refined features. Um, so for example, here, it's like length of, you know, petal or something, uh, more refined features could be some combination of the lengths. Maybe you want to multiply the lengths. So that's an example of a more refined feature, right? A refined feature is okay. I only, I'm not using pixel level features. I'm using something higher order, but maybe that's not enough. Maybe you want to divide, take the ratio of the lengths. Now ratio is a non-linear feature, right? So, um, so here's an example. So petal length over sepal length. So this is a ratio. This is a non-linear feature, right? So it's non-linear because um, uh, you can have two very different petal and sepal lengths and get the same ratio, right? But usually if you have very different petal and sepal lengths, if you sum it up, that's usually different. So that's linear. But obviously there's a definition for linearity, <clears throat> mathematical definition. So this is a non-linear feature. So sometimes, even though you're using a linear model, right, what is a linear model? I think we should probably look at that too. Um, so linear model is something like um, f of x is <clears throat> some h of x transpose w. So h of x is your refined features and w are your parameters. So why is this a linear model? Why is f of x called a linear model? We are like directly multiplying the weights. Yeah, we are linear in the weights. If you look at linear regression, it's some weight vector times some data, right? It's a dot product. Dot product is linear in W. But if you said, okay, I'm going to make it W square or, you know, some other combination of Ws, that then it becomes a nonlinear model. Okay. So the, the, this is a linear model because this is just some constant, right? Even though it's a refined feature, you did some nonlinearity in the refined features. That is still a constant. If you fix X, H of X is a constant. Do you agree? Like, okay, I took some ratio. I multiplied petal, petal length and sepal length. You know, I just used them as is, you know, I combined it and I got this H of X, this feature vector, right? I mean, maybe we should kind of 
make it more explicit. So in this particular case, you know, h of x could be, this is an example, h of x could be petal length, sepal length, and petal to sepal ratio. Maybe you also have petal times sepal. So what's the dimension of this feature vector? an R4, right? So although you might only be given petal and sepal length, you can still take it and construct a feature vector that's a little bit more refined based on your intuition, right? Maybe when a, when a botanist actually looks at a flower, he's looking at the ratio of the petal and the sepal. And he's saying, well, you know, smaller flowers might look smaller in the petal, but the ratio is actually the same right and bigger flowers might look better bigger have bigger petals but if you look at the ratio it's consistent so maybe you're looking you account for the small or the big by taking the ratio so that's using your intuition to guide how you want to use a feature and insert it into h of x right and now h of x is going to be multiplied by these weights so what are these weights doing they're saying how important is petal length how important is sepal length how important is the ratio? How important is the product? The weights are basically giving a weightage or importance to any of these features so that when you get this, you get a score. And if you remember the last lecture, we took a score and converted it into a probability. And that probability will tell you if it is in this class or in this class or in that class. Does that make sense? So, this whole thing about getting the edge is called feature engineering. So you might just get, you know, a few uh, data points on it. You might get only a few raw features, but you can take these raw features and then multiply them, do something with it, and you can just generate a whole bunch of other refined features that are based on your intuition or based on some understanding of uh, maybe you want nonlinearity. So even though this model is linear, it is capturing nonlinearity in the data. Why? Because h of x is nonlinear in x. But the model itself is linear in w. So linear models are simple models. However, because your feature vector h of x is nonlinear, the way you've constructed it, you're still able to say something sophisticated about an image, right? Or you're able to use sophisticated data about the image to make better predictions. Yeah. So this is a kind of a trick in uh, with linear models. You like logistic regression is a linear model. Um, so it is of this kind, right? H of X transpose W. However, you can use your creativity in the feature learning space. And that's why 70% of machine learning, they say in the industry is feature engineering. Or someone has done that 70% of work for you. It could be one of these. Nowadays, we have data engineers who build a lot of data pipelines, and then there could be machine learning engineers who are uploading these features to feature stores. And then you start off a new job, you might just build on top of that. So however, somewhere someone has put in that work to construct all these features and make it available. And you might be reusing them or you might be adding to it in your model. So that's, this is where, you know, uh, data science is a little bit of math but it's also a little bit of coding and a little bit of art <laughs> so the artistic part is how do you construct these features right um, and using your intuition basically um, asking questions and then guiding it so that's feature engineering okay so in this assignment as well you will get an opportunity to do a little bit of creativity with your uh, raw features and get that nice h of x that will give you a good prediction on your data set. Any questions on this? Okay. All right. So um, we discussed a little bit of feature engineering today. Obviously, the feature engineering is dependent on the data set, on the kind of data you're dealing with, right? Are you dealing with image data, text data? Uh, since our course is computer vision, you're typically dealing with images or videos, right? Most likely. So it's, it's all either one of these. 
So there are specific feature engineering, uh, uh, you know, libraries for images. For example, SIFT is one of those features. So you can take an image and say, well, I want to, I want some interesting features that capture interesting things about the image. Maybe it ca captures contrast or edges or whatever. It has some convolutions. So convolution can be a feature. You can take an image, do something with it, and put it into your HFX. Because your X is your image, HFX is this vector. You can just do a convolution and say, OK, this is my value here. And that can be part of your HFX. So you can uh, use SIF features. You can use convolution features. Um, and then you can include it into your image uh, classification model and uh, you know build your feature vector. So this is how it used to be in before the advent of deep learning, right? And it's important to know how it used to be because uh, deep learning kind of makes it into a black box. Now you just pass in an image and deep learning does everything. But it's important to understand what is it, what is deep learning doing? And we'll, when we get to deep learning, we'll discuss more on that. But deep learning is also doing its own feature engineering. It's as it's training the model, it's also figuring out which features, how do you build this HFX? Deep learning is actually learning it from the data and getting this, you know, going through this uh, kind of a pipeline from raw image to refined features to more refined features. So that's where the layers and deep learning come in. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. But as a background, it's important to know how would you get these more refined features. So SIFT is one of them. You can use convolution uh, based features for images as well. And I think in your assignment four, which will probably be a mini project, you will be working directly with image data, right? Raw images instead of high level features, which is in assignment three. So that's where you can experiment. I think maybe you'll have a baseline model where you can actually work on using SIF features or <clears throat> convolution features. And then you can try a more sophisticated model as well, maybe a deep learning model and see how they compare. Okay. Right. So uh, we we took an example of uh, spam classification as an example of binary classification in the last class. Um, we spoke about and it's binary because it's either spam or not spam. So two classes. So any any problem where you have two classes is binary classification. So this is not binary classification because you have three classes. Right. So more than two is multi-class classification. Okay. We spoke about the difference between classification and regression last time. So the target type in regression models is numeric, and the target type in classification is categorical. And this is a good image to have in mind. Like if you if if later on you were like, what is what is exactly the difference between regression and classification? You can see it's very clear in this image that. In regression, you're trying to put, uh, predict the line of best fit, which is passing through most of the points very closely, as closely as possible. Whereas in classification, you're trying to divide two or more than two different types of data points using hyperplanes. Right? And these hyperplanes are helping you discriminate between these classes and making, you know, helping you make predictions on which class does a data point belong to. And again, in this case, it's a linear hyperplane. So again, W transpose X or W transpose H of X, right? So let's, now that we've, now that we know that you can build nonlinear features, we transpose, trans, you know, uh, transpose X by H of X. So now we have W transpose H of X, where H of X is your feature engineered set of features that's put into a vector that we um, kind of do a dot product uh, with and then make a prediction. And if this is positive, it's a positive score, very likely you're in the positive class. If it's a negative score, very likely you're in the negative class. How likely are you? That depends on the probability distribution, the probability that you get from the score. And we also spoke about how you take a score and convert it into a probability. I guess remember from last time, we had a sigmoid function. Uh, I guess that's coming up, but there's a sigmoid function. Okay, we, we, we have a sigmoid function that's able to take uh, a score and convert it into a probability that's between zero and one, right? Um, so you're more confident when the probability that you get from your score is closer to one or closer to zero. Either way, you're very confident. But if you're closer to 0.5, you're 
like there's very high level of uncertainty. So usually you use a threshold and say, okay, if I'm above this threshold or I'm below this threshold, then predict this class or that class. So here you might predict the positive class and here you predict the negative class. Okay. Uh, we, okay, so we spoke about binary multi-class classification, spam classification as example. Um, yeah, we also spoke about linear separability. So, uh, you know, some, so the data, so linear separability is a, is a assumption on the data or a, or a feature of the data. Your data could be linearly separable. Your data could be linearly not separable. And if it's a line, if it's linearly separable, then linear reg, a logistic regression is a good fit, or a linear model is a good fit, right? So, if it's not linearly separable, um, and especially if it's not even approximately linearly separable, which is it is close to linearly separable, which we looked at as well last time. But it's actually very different. There is some nonlinear separation, for instance, is a circular separation, right? And again, we are able to visualize this in two dimensions, but if your feature vector is higher order, then you can't even imagine how it's going to look like. So those are like you can't go and say, oh, let me look at it. Is it linear or nonlinear? We don't know. So and in higher dimensions, it's it's but you can apply. So then how would you know? Then you what you do is you'd apply a linear model. And you get a bad accuracy. You're like, oh, why am I getting a bad accuracy? Is it because there is an issue with my data? Okay, let's go fix the data. Is it because I haven't done good feature engineering? Okay, let's go get some better, higher order features. Oh, is it because um, linear model doesn't work? <laughs> okay, maybe it's that because I've ruled out everything else. So then you go to nonlinear, and now you still have to see that your accuracy improves. If it doesn't improve, then even it's it's not nonlinearity. It's something else. Maybe it's noise, your data is noisy. So when you see that a nonlinear model is giving you better accuracy or better metric than your linear model, there's a clear distinction, then you know nonlinearity makes sense in separability of the classes. And so that's how you can tell that okay, nonlinear model is, is better. So in in and a good example of this is you go to papers and they'll compare a baseline model. With a deep learning model and a linear model, and they'll say deep learning is amazing. And what is deep learning? It's a nonlinear model. So that means for that kind of data set, a nonlinear model is more appropriate because that is how the separation looks like in the feature set that was given to the model for training. Okay. Right. We spoke about approximate linear separability um, and linear models can work here too, right? Because it's approximately is okay or good here. Because yeah, I mean, you'll make a few errors. So accuracy is not gonna be like very high, but it's gonna be reasonable enough for you probably to use it in your application. Um, so this is approximately linear separability. Then we spoke about uh, a simple linear model is logistic regression. There are other linear models um, for, it, for instance, SVM is a linear model that also has a margin, so support vector machine. Um, so we probably will not discuss it here, but you can look it up in the in the book or in a separate course. Um, but yeah, logistic regression is a good linear model because um, it's intuitive. It also ties in with neural networks, which we'll come to in the next. So you take logistic regression and put it together in different layers and suddenly you have a deep learning model or a neural network. Okay. All right. So in logistic regression, the key idea is you take a score and convert it into a probability, right? And we spoke about how we do that using the sigmoid function, which is basically P of Z is one over one plus E to the negative Z. So you take any score and you get a probability. This probability is between zero and one. So yeah, W transpose H of X is giving you a score. W is being learned from the data. The probability is coming from the sigmoid function. The optimization is done on the loss function. 
the loss function is um because we'll get to the loss function but uh the lr looks like this we spoke about this as well the activation function here there's a summation here this is a score and then this is the probability okay and this looks like a neuron right and the this is like a neuron or a neural cell and that's why you can say logistic regression is one of the most basic neural networks it's just one neuron but you take these neurons and stack them and you stack them in different layers you get a neural network so the neural network that we hear about is starting with a logistic regression as a fundamental unit yeah. okay so because the probability is given by one over one plus e to the negative z you just have to plug in w transpose xi or you can say w transpose h of xi the h of xi is your features and xi is your raw data right so usually you don't pass in the raw data you've passed in the features so h of xi and this is going to give us a probability so this is your the y hat i and hopefully y hat i is close to what y i is if y i is zero hopefully y hat i is also close to zero if it if y i is one then y hat i is also close to one then you're doing a good job for most eyes right if, if for most eyes this is true then you're doing a good job with your model and so you have to learn the right w hat if you if you if you didn't do that if you plugged in some random w hat you will get all mixed up results so your accuracy is going to be low. so that's why optimization is important because you're optimizing for w hat you're picking the best w hat that will give you for most eyes your y hat i is going to be close to y i and we spoke about the cross entropy function as a very good loss function for logistic regression because it's able to measure distance between two probability distributions in this case you know it's a simple binary classification so you have a zero or one for y i but you have a probability for y hat i so zero or one is also a probability distribution right it's it's always one or the other, but it's it's a you can say it's a constant probability distribution, but it's still a probability distribution. You could think of it that way, because probability of y i equals zero plus probability of y i equals one is always one, right? So because one of them is one, so other is zero, so the sum is one. So that's a probability distribution. Um, so the cross entropy is motivated motivated by entropy, and we spoke about entropy as a measure of uncertainty in your data. So, and we spoke about uniform distribution having the highest or the maximum entropy among all the distributions possible. And if you had a constant, say this is one and then zero, sorry, the other way around. So you have the, all the probability on zero and then, then there's nothing on one, then this is probably has the lowest entropy, right? Among all the binary um, probability distributions. And then if you had, oops. If you had something like this, 0, 1, this is 0 0.5, this is 0 0.5, this has the highest entropy. So why highest entropy? Because, you know, there is no, you have absolutely no certainty on, is it 0 or 1? Both are equally likely. But in the first case, it's lowest entropy because you know it's 0. And it's also the lowest entropy if your mass is on one. Either way, you're very certain. Okay, so we spoke about entropy. And from entropy comes cross entropy, where you are looking at uncertainty between two distributions. So essentially, you're saying, make Q like P. If P is very uncertain, make Q also very uncertain. If P is very certain, make Q very certain. In our case, P is very certain because it's your label you know this image is you know this kind of a flower or that kind of flower so that means you want q to also kind of mimic that q also will want to be close to it um so binary cross entropy is a measure between two probability distributions right um and we can apply binary cross entropy to our y i's and y hat i's right so y i is one distribution y hat i is the other distribution um So you can say, uh, 
p of 0 is yi, p of, um, well, actually, it's the, yeah, actually, it's not that way. It's p of yi is yi, and p of 1 minus yi is 1 minus yi, because we don't know what yi is. yi can be 0 or 1. So essentially, this is giving you p of 0, p of 1, but it's in terms of yi, right? And the same thing for this one, um, p of y. So p of 0 is y hat i, if y hat i is 0. Um, let's see. In this case, maybe we have to use a convention. So maybe y hat i is um, probability of the probability of it being 1. So then you say p of 0 is 1 minus y hat i, and p of uh, 1 is um, y hat i. Okay. So probability of it being belonging to the first uh, positive class is always y hat i. You're always trying to see if that's high or not. Um, so, so these, uh, and in this actually, maybe I should make a correction here. So we'll use. Um, Q here, Q of one. So basically you have a P and you have a Q, two distributions. So because it's defined this way, you just plug it in here. Okay, Y I comes here, Y hat I comes here, one minus Y I comes here, one minus Y hat I comes there. So that's how you get the cross entropy. So if you were to just take one of this, one of these terms, okay, there's a summation here as well, that's missing because you're summing over all data points. You're saying, or you're averaging over all data points. You're saying, what's the average error or mismatch between yi and y hat i across all the data points? That should be as small as possible. Pick a w so that that is as small as possible. So if you just look at one of these terms and say, why is entropy a good thing? Then you'll see, you can just, let's say I take this y hat i minus one minus y i log 1 minus y hat i. So let's just look at one of these terms. And let's say I want to minimize over y hat i, right? So then I take the derivative with respect to y hat i of this thing and then set it to 0. Right? That'll give me the best y hat i. So this gives me minus y i over y hat i plus 1 minus y i over 1 minus y hat i equals 0. So what does this give me for y hat i? What y hat i would satisfy this equation? Phi i, right? If you plug in y i, if you plug in y hat i as y i, you'll get zero in this equation. Do you agree? So given a choice, the model would like to set everything to be y i, but that's not going to happen because y hat is a function of x i. But as much as possible, it's going to bring your y hat i to be close to y i. Again, it's a limitation of the linear model if you're not able to get all the for all the i's, the y hat i equals y i. It's a limitation because linear model can only do so much, right? But it'll get you as much as you can with the linear model. But you can see here, if you only had one data point, no problem. I will set y hat i to y i. But since I have so many data points and I'm using a linear model, I can go as much as a linear model can go by optimizing this loss function. So that's why binary cross entropy is a good loss function to optimize for and pick, you know, choose your parameters in that way. Does that make sense? And if you think about any machine learning model, so this is very important to understand. Any machine learning model anywhere that's anywhere remotely supervised has a loss function. And that loss function is there for a reason. It is doing something that can give you the best model in this kind of a sense, right? Like cross entropy, you just saw y hat i is equal to y i if it had a choice. It would set it that way. So you will have a different loss function for linear regression because that does that makes a lot of sense there. If you optimize it, you will get the right result. You have a different loss function for, let's say, GANs, 
or uh, you know some other diffusion model you have a different loss function but so loss function is the key defining it right which uses data and everything and gives you the so that itself is you know a separate topic how do you get loss functions but once you have loss function your libraries in uh, scikit-learn or pytorch or tensorflow are optimizing those loss functions and giving you the best possible parameters for those problems and then you say, oh, I made a, I just used a diffusion model and I generated image from text. How did it generate it? It optimized a loss function somewhere. And then it got some parameters that is being used to generate these images, right? Might be a very complicated loss function, but there is some loss function somewhere. Right. Um, okay, so let's say you've, um, let's talk about prediction. So let's say you uh, you have you you've already optimized for this. So your W hat is optimized. Then you have a data point i. You want to see what is the probability of data point i belonging to class one. Just plug it in here. You get a probability, and that's you can see if that probability is high. You will say yeah, it belongs to class one. If the probability is low, which means close to zero, you say it belongs to class zero. So at prediction, it's easy. Once you've trained your W hat, you've already done your optimization. For prediction of probability of a class, you just plug it in and you get a probability score. So um, just to be comfortable with the math, let's just take at this, uh, take a look at this in class exercise. Um, shouldn't take you more than a minute to look at it. And there can be more than one right option on this in class exercise. Okay, so what's your answer? A is one of the answers. A is one of the answers. Probably a D is not ever to. So it's a log probability, it's not just a probability. So you take the log of the probability. So yeah, the probability of y hat i equals zero is a. Do you guys agree? Just one minus probability of y hat i equals y. So a is actually the probability of y hat i equals zero. Now you just have to apply a log to it. So you see that gives you b. But also, if you divide the numerator and denominator by e to the negative w hat transpose xi, you get c. So both b and c are the right answer. So both b and c are valid. It's just a sign change in c, but it's the same as b. Okay, so uh, a quick summary of uh, logistic regression. It uses a linear model. It's a linear model because it's based on a score, which is W transpose H of X, say SI is W transpose X of X I. Um, and it's just like linear regression, which is also linear. Uh, it assumes linear separability or approximate linear separability. So assumes that you can approximately linearly separate these classes um, and if if not, you can still apply the linear model, but you may not good 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 uh, get good results. Uh, you may not be able to move beyond a certain accuracy level if a linear model doesn't work. So despite so the thing is it's a linear model, but you also have feature engineering. So despite the best feature engineering, the linear model can still fail because it's linear. So that's where nonlinear models like deep learning come, and they can construct better features on their own automatically. Um, yeah. So linear regression, linear um, logistic regression, similar, both of them are based on taking W transpose XI. Uh, and linear regression is just this. 
it is just a score. So linear regression is giving you a score, but logistic regression is giving you a probability. So you can think logistic regression is taking the linear regression and adding a probability on top of it, but also training on data that looks different. Now, once you've added a probability, your, uh, your YIs are no longer a score, they are a class. So linear regression and logistic regression are very close to each other. One is just predicting the score, the other is predicting the class. And yeah, so yeah, the range for linear regression can be in negative infinity to infinity, whereas for logistic regression is between zero and one. Okay, we know log logistic regression uses the sigmoid or S shaped function to go from a score to a probability. Um, logistic regression uses the log loss or cross entropy loss. We looked at the cross entropy loss whereas linear regression uses the quadratic loss, right? So x theta minus y square, or if you're using w, x w minus y square. So this is a quadratic loss. Okay. Uh, some extra bit of information, uh, which we'll also discuss in the next course on in machine learning. Logistic regression loss can be derived as a maximum likelihood estimator. So it's, uh, you know, statisticians are happy with this fact because it's grounded in statistics. Um, okay, so let's go to a second in class exercise. Um, let's take a look at this and then we'll get back. Okay. Um, but this is still interesting. If you look at it, um, your data set has 100 spam emails and 900 non-spam emails. So one class has 100 data points and, uh, and the other class has 900 data points. So this is called class imbalance because the classes don't have the same number of data points or similar number of data points. What happens with class imbalance is your metrics, some of your metrics can give you a spurious you know, positives, they can say you're doing great, but when, when you're actually not doing good, right? What's an example here? You can say everything is not spam. Yeah. If everything is not spam, you're 90% accurate. Like, wow, I'm 90% accurate on my email data set. That's amazing. I know you're not 100%, but 90 is still good. I'm happy. But what were you doing? You were saying everything is not spam. So did you detect spam? No, <laughs> you're 0% on spam. So the metric can be spurious on class imbalance. That's one. Second, your model may not be able to learn to differentiate spam versus not spam. Why? Because you're mostly showing it non-spam. So it's getting biased towards predicting non-spam. So it might not learn spam well. So one is your metric is off. Second, your model is not learning better from your data. So that's why class imbalance can be a big issue. And so when you notice, when you look at your data set, you have to see, is there class imbalance here? If there is class imbalance, you can do downsampling of the dominant class or upsampling of the non-dominant class. So in, in this case, you might want to upsample your spam emails, uh, like you know, generate different versions of the same spam emails and then call them spam so that your model gets enough examples to differentiate the two, okay? So class imbalance can make something go wrong like in either in the metrics or in the model space, right? Can impact metrics or can impact um, models learning. So like we said, the accuracy for this data set is 90%. If you just look at how many things did you get right? You got all the non-spam right. Why? Because you said everything is non-spam. Big deal. But you got the spam wrong, which is only 10%. But it's that's what you are building a classifier for. You're not building a classifier for not spam. <laughs> You're building a classifier for spam. So you have to do well on that. So this is where something called the confusion matrix can help us understand uh, what's happening better. So what is a confusion matrix? The rows of this matrix are the positive or the negative class labels and the, and the columns are your predictions. Is it positive or a negative prediction, right? So you can see there are 100 positives, so 100 spam, for example, 
and 900 negatives, which is 100 not 900 not span. Okay, so this is the rows. The columns are your predictions. Since you predicted everything as negative, all your all your predictions are negative. So thousand predictions are in the negative because you said so that's what you're doing. But of them, you got 900 right, and then 100 are wrong, right? So the accuracy is 90%. Can you do can so accuracy is not really capturing what's going on here. Because if you use accuracy, you'll say I'm doing well. So maybe you need a better metric, which will come out of this confusion matrix. It'll clear the confusion and you'll see the light. Okay. So uh, what's a better metric? Yeah. So better metric is based on something called precision recall and F score. So for classification, people typically use precision recall. And if you just want one metric that combines both precision and recall, that's F1 score or F score. So to understand precision recall, let's look at the individual elements in this confusion matrix. So this is true positive, right? Which is of all the positives, how many did you predict right? So that's true positive it means you predicted positive, but it's also positive. That's true positive. False positive, I predicted positive, but it's false. It's actually a negative. You predicted spam, but it's actually not spam. So that's false positive. False negative, I predicted not spam, but it's actually a spam. So our trivial classifier is having a lot of false negatives because it's, it's putting everything as not spam. True negative, I predicted not spam and it is not spam. Great. So these two are good places to be here. These two, you don't want to be here, right? In this case, because of class imbalance, accuracy is looking at this diagonal. So accuracy is taking the diagonal and dividing it up by the total. So the diagonal is 900 plus zero, total is 1000. So accuracy is 90%. So instead of just looking at the diagonal, you have to look at the whole confusion matrix you can get a better understanding of what's going on. And that's what precision and recall are going to give us, right? So precision is true positive. So let's just call it here. True positive, false positive, false negative, and true negative. Okay. So precision is true positive over true positive plus false positive. So precision is looking at this column here. And it's saying of all the positives, how many did I get it right? Right. Um, so in this case, uh, your precision is also going to be 100% because there was nothing. You didn't predict anything as positive and none of them were positive either. So it, so it's zero by zero. So that's like, you can see if you say that's one, zero by zero is not defined, but let's say it's one, then you say precision is good. Well, so precision is not really telling you the picture, although it's an important metric, it's not giving you the full story. So then you look at recall. Recall is now looking at the row, right? Recall is looking here. It's saying of all the positives, how many did you get it right? So we know the positives is 100. Of the 100, how many did we get it right? Zero. So recall is actually 0% in this case. Precision is like zero by zero. So let's say that's 100%. So even precision can misguide you. But recall is not misguiding you. Recall is saying you didn't do uh, you, you didn't do anything, so you're really bad. You're zero percent. And F one score is the harmonic mean of precision and recall. So that's why this two times precision times recall over precision plus recall is a harmonic mean. So if your recall is zero, guess what? F one score is also zero percent. But your accuracy is 90%, because as we spoke, diagonals. So now if you look at F1 score as your indicator of, are you do is this classifier doing well? Class imbalance, no class imbalance is going to give you a better picture of what's going on. Yeah. If there was class balance, maybe accuracy is also not a bad idea, but with class imbalance, or so this kind of a weird scenario where you're doing some, you're cheating or you're doing something else, uh, your F1 score is going to catch it. It's going to be like, no, you're doing a bad job. 
So this is a very good example of why you shouldn't be using just precision or just accuracy, but something like F1 score that is able to combine precision and recall, right? So recall is, so the other terminology that you'll hear in the literature is coverage, right? So recall is like, are you able to cover what we really care about? Like I want to, I care about spam. Are you covering it or you're not covering it? So here the coverage is 0%, which makes sense because you didn't capture any spam emails. <laughs> you're saying everything is not spam. So sorry, your coverage is bad. But precision is saying, how often do you make mistakes in your predictions? So here I didn't predict anything as positive and I didn't make any mistakes because I didn't predict anything as positive. Um, so, or you can also do precision for the negative class. In this case, the pressure for the negative class is 90%, right? I predicted everything as negative and 90% of it is right. So again, pressure is telling you, how often do you make mistakes? So the key lesson here is even if your model doesn't make mistakes as per precision, it may not be covering what you care about, which is recall. So that is the reason you have to look at both precision and recall. And then your F1 score is able to combine it as a harmonic mean, right? So F1 score is high only if precision and recall are high. If one of them is low, F1 score is low. So F1 score is dominated by the lower of the precision and recall. So it's only as good as the lower of the two. So in this case, your recall is zero, so your F1 score is impacted by that, and so it's a, it's it's telling you the true story here. Any questions on this? Clear? So let's clear the confusion, or maybe more confusion for you, is to do this in class exercise and just again a different data set. Um, you can see um, there is still imbalance, but not as much as in the previous one. Um, well, actually, this 100 and 500. So, yeah, there is class imbalance here, but you don't have these zeros and stuff. So, let's compute accuracy, precision, recall, and F1 score as we discussed on the previous slide. So, maybe take uh, two or three minutes uh, to just work it out. It's a very good exercise. So you can be completely clear on this. Okay, what's your answer? D. D? Yeah, it has to be A or D, right? Cannot be B or C because the uh, accuracy is 75%. Okay, great. And I maybe to differentiate A or D, you can just look at the precision and the pressure is uh, 50 over 150, which is uh, close to D, right? And it's not close to A. Okay. Right. okay, so this is metrics, the metrics side of uh, classification. So almost any classification model, you can change the model. You can change logistic regression to SVM, or you can change it to deep learning or whatever. The metrics are going to be similar because you're looking at a classification problem. So the type of problem de determines the metrics. If you're looking at regression, that's a different type of problem. So you would use root mean square error, right? RMSE, right? That's more of a quadratic error. So the metrics are determined by the problem, uh, not impacted by which specific classifier you are using. Okay. Uh, obviously, if you're using a binary versus multi-class, so that's again, multi-class is a different problem. So you might get a variation on the binary class metrics um but depending on the class of the problem the metrics will change if you have recommender systems you'll have a different set of metrics uh, that was one of the courses we had i think in summer this year so yeah again depends on the problem space so this now now this met these sort of metrics are good for classification there's also one more it's uh, called auc or area under the curve which is essentially you remember the threshold that we were using to say it belongs to this class or that class so if you change the threshold, your predictions change, isn't it? Because your threshold determines are you in the positive or negative class. So for different thresholds, you can plot the precision versus recall curve. 
and that curve, the area under that is a metric. So that is telling you, doesn't matter what threshold I use when I compare two algorithms, on an average, this algorithm is better because across all these different thresholds, I'm doing better. So that's AUC. So AUC is another um, metric. Another curve. So with so many metrics, which do you use uh, to measure performance of your model? Well, if you're doing these broad sweeps uh, with thresholds, then AUC is obviously better, captures everything. If you uh, are just, if you're, if you're not so concerned about it, then you can use F1 score. Uh, but you wouldn't use accuracy, you wouldn't use precision by itself or recall by itself. You could also report precision and recall as two different metrics. But if you want one metric, then you would compare F1 score. Okay. Okay, let's move on to training. And this is connected to the in-class exercise we saw a little bit earlier. Is <clears throat> So training is important because um, we, we spoke about, uh, you know, optimizing the loss function on data, but which data? And what does that data look like? So let's say we have a data table that looks like this, right? Maybe, so these are your features. And this is your target. And you want to take these features, pass it through some linear model or some, let's say, linear model. And then you want to predict y. OK. So and maybe you have uh, maybe you have n rows here. So that means you have n data points to begin with. So let's say you download a data set from Kaggle or someplace, and it has n data points. You don't train on that. You don't train on that n data points because we are going to split it into training data, validation data, and test data. And that's very important for any machine learning algorithm. So now this is independent of what problem you're looking at. You can look at classification, you can look at regression, you can look at you know any anything where you're doing supervision. You will have to divide your data set into training, validation, and test. So training, typically you take 70 to 80% of your complete data set and then say that's my training data and you decide that at random so here you can see these green lines are picked at random they're not like you can just reorder you can do different uh you know order but basically these are picked at random so you pick seven of these rows so here let's say there are 10 rows these give you seven rows and these seven rows become your training data those x's and the y the combination of that that becomes your training data then 20 percent you would probably assign to test so then you pick two of the remaining at random. So we had choice of three. So we pick the top and the bottom at random, right? So you divide randomly and then call it the test data. And then whatever is left is your validation data set. So maybe 10% here, 20% here. And then this is 70%. So if you so again the 70 20 10 it's usually a little bit of a choice let's say you 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 have very little data overall you only have 1000 data points and that's not enough then you might say let's do 80 10 10 because i i need to use it for training if i didn't use it then i won't get a good model but you still have to do validation you still have to do testing so the remaining 20 you will split as 10 10 instead of 70 20 10 you might do 80 10 10 so again this is kind of a choice that you typically make uh, depending on what kind of data set you're dealing with. Uh, but this, these are suggestions, 70, 10, 20, or 80, 10, 10 is a split. So now that you have these greens, reds, and blues, you train on green, you test on the red, you validate on the blue, right? So train, actually you validate first. So train on green, validate on the blue, and then test on the red. That's the sequence. Testing comes at the very end. Okay, so why split the data into train validation test? This is a very important question, right? Why not just, you know, use all the data? Like, what's the point of all of this? So training data set, we train on the training data. You have to train because if you didn't train, how will you get that W? How will you get that best W? How will you get that best line that is differentiates? How do you, how do you, you have to optimize? So you need training data. Okay, great. So we'll use training data. So that's obvious. But the question is, why do you need test and validation data. So test data is used to evaluate your model you trained. 
like you need to evaluate a model right how are you going to evaluate on the training data no that doesn't make sense so test data mimics unseen data if you train if you evaluate on your training data it is like that spam classification example you can just like say everything is non oh there's a class imbalance great i'll predict everything is non spam and get away with it or you can just copy all the labels you say oh this i see it's spam maybe i'll just predict spam i see it's not spam you're just copying it so you don't want to copy and say that's my prediction that's so bad you shouldn't do that so you shouldn't evaluate your model on the training data on the data that you actually trained your model on because you're going to really you can do all fancy tricks and make it as good as possible you can overfit and then you'll say oh i have 99 percent accuracy so that's uh really not evaluation so test data is mimicking something you have not seen you're not going to touch the test data for training it's only going to be used for test you're going to keep it separate it's just like i train to see if something some image is a cat or some image is a dog okay then someone hands you an elephant <laughs> then you're like hmm i don't know <laughs> So that's that's how test data is in in reality, right? You get something that's that could be quite different. So you may not get a regular cat. Maybe you get a scary cat in your test image. So again, that's unseen data. You never know what's coming to you. Someone is uploading an image of a cat that looks really, you know, very different. But you still want to be able to predict that's a cat. So that's testing the model on its ability to handle unseen data. So that's why you keep the test data a little bit aside and don't touch it, only use it when your model is ready. Don't go and say, oh, I'm performing badly on tests, let me go and fix my training. And then I, maybe I'll now I'll do better. That's cheating, right? You're, you're using the test data in some sense to improve on your uh, training. So uh, evaluation, evaluation is done on training just to see how you value your training, but that's not the final evaluation. Your final evaluation happens on the test data. Okay, so we don't bias our evaluation. Okay, so that makes sense. Test data, uh, you need to at least have some percentage. So let's say 20%, but why do we need validation data set? So this is where hyperparameters come in. You know, you, you can tune your hyperparameters. Uh, you can tune any, like, let's say in the case of, um, uh, let's say, you know, let's say you were doing total variation with some supervision that Lambda is a hyperparameter. Or if you have logistic regression and you have a, a regularizer, that lambda again is uh, a hyperparameter. Or if you're doing neural networks, the number of layers in your neural network, that could be a hyperparameter. Or the number of neurons in a particular layer, that could be a hyperparameter. That's not something you optimize for in training, because how do you represent that? It's hard. You can optimize continuous things. You cannot optimize these kind of really jumpy things. So you reserve those to be hyperparameters. So they are parameters, but not like the ones you train in training data. They are that's why you call them hyperparameters, and those are well optimized on validation data set. So you're kind of validating the model, you like fine tuning it, but again, not on test data. You're fine tuning on a separate data. So that's why you need validation data set. I can't fine tune on training data because you know uh, I really don't know how it will look like when I go to test. So that's why I keep a separate data set aside and then say, I'll find you on the validation data set. And now we are ready to test the model on the test data set. And hopefully we do well. So typically, if you validated your model well on the validation data set, you usually do well on test data set. So you do get a chance to improve your model through your validation data set so that you can do well on test data and unseen data sets. Okay. So this is how it's set up. People, it's just tried and tested. You know, you go, you use any library that's going to doing any machine learning. It will either do automatic splitting for you. It'll say, okay, I've already divided things in a train validation test. Don't worry about it. Or it'll give you an option and you can choose uh, to divide it yourself. And uh, yeah, then you train on train, validate on validation and test on test. And all that confusion matrix that we saw in the previous in class exercise, you report on the test data. Then you'd say my F1 score on test looks like this. My F1 score on, you will still have an F1 score on train, but that's not what you report. You'll still have an F1 score on validation, but you will report F1 score on test and say, 
like let's say you're comparing algorithms i mean what does reporting mean maybe you're comparing algorithms you have three four different algorithms then you can compare them on the test data set and say okay because my f1 score is good on the test data set for algorithm a i will choose algorithm a as my choice for classification Any questions on this paradigm? Might have seen before, but it's a very important paradigm. It's kind of bread and butter of machine learning is train validation, test splits. And you will use this for assignment three. So when you get a data set, uh, you can, is Ayush, is, is it broken up already or we, they have to break it up? Yes. Uh the code to like break it up has been added uh in between uh so i think we have 100 uh points in the training and 25 each in the test and val yeah okay. so i mean the code is there they just, they just have to run it okay okay so the code is already there so that's easy for you but you can again play around with it the, if you do a different split you'll get a different slightly different model so there is randomness in this right it's not like you had one data set and you'll get one result because you're splitting in the train validation, let's say uh, one of you trains a model on the same data set and the other trains a model on the same data set, you have the same percentage split, you might still get a different result because there is randomness in the splitting. And maybe you're using a different random seed and that might give you a different result. There is also randomness in the algorithm, the SGD, that's the, the gradient descent that's running behind the scene. So don't be surprised if you're comparing results and you're like, oh, why is your prediction better? I mean, aren't we doing the same thing? Uh, maybe you run it again and you'll get a different result. Okay. So just make note of any random seeds that are changing between consecutive runs of yourself or someone else you're comparing with. Okay. And if you want to just like fix it and say, I don't want all of this to change, then just fix the random seed. Fix a random seed for splitting the data, fix a random seed for your algorithm. And that way, because the random seed is fixed, you will get a deterministic result every single time you get the same result. Um, so for logistic regression, where does validation come in? So let's look at that. So if, if you are, and I think we haven't spoken about, yeah, so we'll spoke, speak about overfitting, but let's say in, you have a loss function L of W, plus lambda the L1 norm. So this could be your binary cross entropy loss. So you want to optimize for this, but maybe there is something called overfitting. Maybe you want to make sure overfitting is avoided. We'll talk about overfitting in a bit. So you add this extra regularization, just like in total variation, you saw the total variation was trading off two things, right? The distance from the no the noisy image and the smoothness of the image. So here, this L1 norm is not smoothing, but it's um, helping with something called overfitting, which we'll talk about in a bit. Now you see there is this lambda again here, and this is a hyperparameter, which you tune on validation. So if it happens, and I don't know if it'll happen on your assignment three, but maybe assignment four, that you're overfitting, then you might want to add a regularization. And then that hyperparameter lambda will have to be tuned on your validation data set, which you already split uh, to begin with. And then you might say, okay, lambda equals 0.01, I'm getting the best F1 score, great. Let's fix lambda to be 0.01 and then train a W. And at, at test time, you will again predict based on that trained W in your validation data set, uh, tuned W on your validation data set. And then you'll report the result on that. Okay. All right, so um, let's just, yeah, look at one more in class exercise. Um, okay, what's your answer? Three, yeah. Um, 
So obviously, if if your accuracy is high, your pressure and recall are high, looks like it's performing well. But the catch here is it was done on the training data set, which we said you shouldn't be doing. It doesn't mean you're not performing well. It's just that there could be differences on the test data set. So you need to check and see you're performing well. So the checking here refers to checking on the test data set. And you're, are, you, are you doing well on test two? Well, if you are, okay, good, great. Likely you are, but there are scenarios where you might do well on train, but not so well, not so good on test. And that's called overfitting. Okay. So the phenomenon of overfitting is when your model performs great on training data, but doesn't match up on test data. There is some gap. I got 90% on training data for F1 score. I'm getting only 60% on test data. Why? Because you might be overfitting. So the overfitting means you really highly optimize for your training data and you forgot that there could be other kinds of data. Training data is a sample, right? If, if, you, if I gave you a different sample, you would get a different model. So you highly optimize for this particular sample and didn't realize there could be other variations on the samples, right? What if, 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 what if all your cats are like this, <laughs> right? Then only if a cat is like this, you will predict it's a cat. If it's like this, you will say it's not a cat because you have optimized for this. <laughs> so, you know, that's overfitting. So accounting, like accounting for the fact that there could be other images or other kinds of data helps you not overfit. And that's why we, we have this kind of a regularization. So sometimes when you're overfitting, your parameters become large. So this is controlling the size of the parameters and saying, okay, don't worry too much about this. Focus on other things as well. Uh, that's happening in the image to detect if it's a cat or not. Okay. So here's another example of overfitting. Let's say your data set has images of roses that are red and jasmines that are yellow. In your test data, you see a yellow rose and your model predicts it's a jasmine. Why? It optimized for color. It's like, oh, in my data set, everything, everything that's called a rose is red. So everything that's, that's called a jasmine is yellow. So yellow color means jasmine. And so if you show a yellow rose, sorry, not happening, right? So this is an issue this is an, this you can call this overfitting because you like really highly optimize for your training data without accounting for other variations in your data set. But there's also an issue with data coverage. Maybe if you had added yellow roses to your training data, you might do better. So it's both overfitting and also data coverage issue. And data coverage issue is very common in the industry. It's one of the most common problems. So data problems are more problematic in the industry setting than you know using the best possible model right you have so 80 percent of your battle is getting the data right and you know setting everything right so then you can do machine learning or computer vision and get a good model right. um, so here you might see the training error is very low like you perfectly can identify red roses and yellow jasmines but as soon as I give you a yellow rose, you're, you know, sorry, not happening. So yeah, to account for overfitting, um, you can increase coverage on the data. You can also use regularization. There's many different tricks. And with, when we come to deep learning and uh, convolutional neural networks, CNNs, we'll see there are other tricks that also help with overfitting specific to neural networks. So the figure to remember for overfitting is on the x-axis you have model complexity. This is low model complexity, this is high model complexity. Low means like linear models, let's say. High is nonlinear models. And there are two errors here. You see there's training error and there's test error. So typically, the more complex your model, the you can, it's like if, if your model is complex, you can say, I can fit any function. I can fit to the data very well. So your training error is going down as your model complexity increases, right? So, uh, you know, a classic example is you have three data points that looks like this. And then you say, well, you know what? This thing goes exactly through all the points. So this is my function. 
But isn't this an overfit? What if I give you a new data point that looks somewhere here? You're nowhere close to the picture because you're going to predict something else. So you can have very high model complexity and have 0% error, 100% accuracy on training data. But as soon as I give you another test data point, you might fail. So that's why the training error keeps going down in this graph as your model complexity increases because you can do better. But if I use a linear model, for instance, a linear model is, you know, going to incur some error because the predictions are not exactly there, but it's also going to do well on test data. Like it's not going to have this drastic jump with, with this crazy nonlinear model. You're doing amazing on training data. As soon as I give you an extra data point, you fail because you, you made crazy assumptions and you had crazy number of parameters. With linear model, I'm not doing as well on the training data, but I'm also not doing as badly on the test data. So my training data is giving me confidence on how I'll do on the test data, right? So that's maybe your true model is somewhere in between. It's neither linear nor very highly nonlinear. Maybe you are somewhere in between. So that is what this test error is telling us. So as you go from a very simple model to a complex model, the test error also goes down. But after a while, like this pink model that crazily overfits, the test error goes up. So there is a sweet spot where your training error is obviously going down, but your test error starts to go up. At that sweet spot, if you stop, that's the right level of model complexity. So for instance, here, your test error is starting to go up. Your training error is anyway going down. So pick a model of that level of complexity where so that's where you are not overfitting so you can say this is um so you can say this is good fit what is this is this overfit or underfit so look at Look at something here. Overfit, right? Because your training error is low. Amazing. Training error is great. I optimize for training error, but my test error is off. So I overfit. I shouldn't have fit so much. I shouldn't have placed so much emphasis with so many parameters to fit to this data. On the other hand, you can underfit. So in underfit, your training error is is going down but you know it's also high it's not the best and also your your test error is also the same as training error there's not much gap but hey there's more you can do you can do better you can improve both train and test error so then you're underfitting that means you're not you're using a much simpler model so the the level of complexity of a model uh you know tells you can tell you if you're underfitting or overfitting uh how do you even generate this graph? Well, you have to try models of different levels of complexity. Maybe you use a logistic regression, then you use SVM, then you use random forest, then you use deep learning. Those would be your x-axis. Like four or five different models are giving you four or five different levels of complexity. And your y-axis, okay, how's my training error going down? How's my test error going down? And then you're like, oh, okay, random forest is good, but deep learning is overfitting. So random forest is like the good best fit model that I'm going to use here. Okay, so let's take a look at this in class exercise and then we can probably stop for the day. Okay, what's your answer? Perfect, yeah. You agree? So if you're going to have a parameter for every pixel, maybe you know you're gonna have some combination of those pixels and say it is this or that. It could be a linear model or in this case, we are just saying, yeah, maybe it's a linear model. Okay. That's 25, that's like 250,000 parameters. But how many data points do we have? Only 10,000. So you're fitting a model that has 250,000 parameters, like going like crazy, with just 10,000 data points. So here again, the other way to think about overfitting is compare the number of data points with the number of parameters. 
if the number of data points is small, but as compared to the number of parameters, you're going to overfit. If the number of data points is higher as compared to the number of parameters, you're less likely to overfit and you might be doing fine. So on the one hand, you can compare models of different complexity and look at the train test uh, curves to determine if you're overfitting or not. On the other hand, you can also just look at number of parameters versus number of data points to understand are you likely to overfit or not. And, and then you will see, yeah, actually, even before you do the training, so here, even before we do the training, even before you run the model, train the model, you can say, I think there's a likelihood that I'm going to overfit. And then when you did the training, you might also see that your test data accuracy is much lower than expected as compared to the training data accuracy. So that also validates your idea that you're going to overfit. Okay. So the, uh, the, there is thumb rules here. The thumb rule is if your data is on the order of the number of parameters, you're you know just about fitting right, or you may not overfit. But as soon as your parameters start to increase as compared to the data size, you're going to overfit. Like again, remember this curve. There's like three data points, but you might have a tenth degree polynomial or 15 degree polynomial. So 15 is the number of parameters. You have three data points. With three data points, you fit a 15 degree polynomial and you're overfitting like crazy. So number of parameters as compared to the number of data points tells you, are you underfitting or overfitting? Great, I think we'll stop here. Um, any questions or thoughts on anything we discussed today?